Hey there, little buddies, and welcome to yet another edition of the Boob Tube Buddies podcast. In this episode, we discuss chapter four of the FX original series, Legion. I'm Mothman, and I'm joined by the parasite to my psyche, Nathan with yellow eyes. Hey, oh, I like that. That's, that's, that makes me feel good. Hey, I will let you know, you can talk about uh, chapter four all you want. I'm going to be talking about chapter five this, this episode, though. Oh, God damn it. I pulled a Foxman. <laughs> I've called Fox on that so many times where he'll really like, he'll, he'll paste he'll do exactly what I just did which is you know I, I write some real basic shorthand notes on my phone during the episode sure. yeah. and then I basically email them to myself I paste them into like a new text edit document and then I just go to last week's and copy and paste but you know normally I change that number god damn it yeah <laughs> anyway normally I'm a consummate professional well uh speaking of professionalism we're on all Unless- this what? Go ahead. Uh, I guess unless you had more you wanted to say about chapter four, in which case we can spend another 20, 30 minutes on chapter four. I have more I want to say about the whole series that's going to happen organically in the next hour. Ooh. <laughs> God damn it. Uh, I'll allow you to continue with your plug. Yeah. Social medias. We're on Twitter. We're on Facebook. We're on YouTube. We are on Instagram. Mm-hmm. Um, yep. And we love hearing from our followers. Uh, so please hit us up there. Also, if you like what you hear, subscribe to us on iTunes. Uh, and give us a review. Uh, even if you don't listen to every single episode, subscribing simply helps our indexing, which means when someone goes and searches Iron Fist, um, instead of just getting terrible reviews, they might see the Boob Tube Buddies podcast. Shit. <laughs> I wondered how early you were going to start talking about that. Oh, uh, I mean, it's going to be the first bomb Marvel's ever had. I, I mean, it sucks. I, it does suck. That I mean, one, like at, at a certain point, you're playing with fire. Like, you're going to have to have that happen. But. Yeah. Um, we're Fox and I are still definitely going to review the pilot episode and then we're going to watch the whole thing and do a season recap. Now, of course, ah. if we just end up liking it, maybe we'll do one every episode. But like, never mind. Yeah, we're going to talk about every episode, especially if it becomes like a train wreck type thing where people watch it to see the it might, it might be one of the most popular Marvel franchises yet because everyone just from wants how to bad see it. it is. Yeah, I don't know. Anyway, <laughs> enough about those Marvel franchises. How are you doing today? I'm so glad we're going to be doing Legion. It's a little late, but that's because, uh, you know, Nathan deserved a vacation. Yeah, yeah. Sorry about that. Uh, but uh, the second I got back, the first thing I did was uh, start watching this episode of Legion because I was I was super excited. I was sad. The day that it aired, uh, I was in Mexico. Mexico. Hmm, Mexico. Yeah. Yeah, oh. I was in the, the Yucatan Peninsula. <laughs> peninsula. Somewhere. Well. It's the peninsula. Um, we speculated in chapter four. So yeah, let's talk about chapter four. We speculated in chapter four that, um, you thought Carrie was going to die. And I was like, maybe, I did, and I was maybe wrong. they're not connected. It really yeah. wasn't either one. They both survived. Like, you know, the female Carrie yeah. was brought back to the compound. So I guess we don't fully know that if she were to die, if it would actually kill him. What we do get to right. see is he's still obviously like emotionally and mentally affected, but Yep. I couldn't see him actually be physically wounded until they merged back together, and then his face was all bruised up. Right, yeah, and he said something about, like, if he were to absorb her to heal her, that he would, uh, it would infect him or something like that, or it would, you know, it would damage him irreparably, essentially. Um, so the, their their sort of relationship is something that it's, I think, far too complex for even the show to fully explain. Um, I think there are going to be a lot of gaps in our knowledge about what that sort of that sort of ability is because it's almost one that makes more sense in explanation than it does visually. Like he can absorb her and she can leave his body, but you know, it's, it's, it's something I don't think we'll ever get a full explanation for. I like though that that character is still alive because I think that's a super cool and very unique ability. And I'm, I'm excited to continue to see Carrie and Carrie. Yeah. You talk about their like relationship and there is almost a moment later, like he lays on, you know, she basically lays on top of him and like lays back and that's when they become one. But there's another yeah. scene, uh, like scene later where they're talking to each other and it kind of looks like they're about to bang. <laughs> and then they don't. I'm trying to determine how to mentally, I'm thinking, is it like a brother sister relationship? Are they in sort of a relationship? Is it just a very close friendship or is it like, imagine one day another you showed up. I feel um, like it's an it just, important distinction because if they hooked up it's either incest or just masturbation you're <laughs> right and either way i don't know if i want to see it yeah no i, I mean it would, it would probably be off screen but if it happened i mean yeah one of them is just abhorrent the other one is just you know part of life 
<laughs> Very complex norm- ground they're covering here. It is. I, we're diving into really, really deep stuff here in the X-Men franchise. Hey, hey, speaking of the X-Men franchise, and I'm sure you guys have talked about it, but I am stoked on the X-Men franchise this week uh, just because I did get to see Logan this week. Just, uh, yeah, uh, Logan is phenomenal. Oh, my God. And it had me so stoked after that to be like, I'm going to, oh, man, no, I'm going to go watch Legion, even though they have so, so very little to do with each other at all. They, but I they, found myself watching... Mm -hmm. Well, they do have little to do with each other, but I like that you bring it up because um, it seems like Fox has realized Marvel has the market cornered outside of Iron Fist for like good family fun um, superhero movies. And they've almost become like the new Pixar because each of their movies, not each of them, but a lot of movies are in their like own genres and they're even doing that even more so with the TV shows. Um, Yeah. Fox, though, I think has realized like we're always kind of behind the pace We've obviously had some good success and some good films with X-Men. Fantastic Four, we continually don't want to talk about. Right. Um, <laughs> then you have, like, the separate Spider-Man stuff. But now I think with Deadpool, they're like, you know what? Let's just do the mature stuff. Um, yeah. And I don't know yeah. if they're going to stay with that. But, like, between that, between Logan, between this show, which is very mature, um, and, which, I mean, it's kind of a reveal later in the show, he now... Uh, is revealed to that he has adopted, which completely opens the door for Professor X to be in there. And Patrick Stewart said in this last week, even though he's retired as Professor X, he would consider doing it for Legion. Oh, I didn't see that. That's cool. Yeah. So um, that would be But wouldn't it be James McAvoy, Professor X, in this time period? Uh, Not if he... I mean, maybe. Uh, Yeah. I mean, I guess they could twist time in some sort of cool way, but uh, I I like what you're saying, though, about the X-Men franchise not being afraid to be dark because, you know, that's sort of what Marvel got to finally do with their Netflix series is be a little bit darker. But that's still on the fringe of the Marvel Cinematic Universe. Yeah, The Marvel Cinematic Universe largely, you know, Doctor Strange is its own genre and Guardians of the Galaxy is its own other genre, sure. But for the most part, you're you're right, family-friendly, you know, and finally Captain America Winter Soldier is like a Bond film. Right, yeah, so they yeah. get the secret agent films. But for the most part, yeah, they're they're family-friendly. And uh, I, I think that if FX or if Fox wants to do something with the titles that or the, the IPs that they still own, going dark and going a little grittier and not being afraid to do so, it, it seems to be paying out well for them because, you know, Logan is getting absolutely yeah. fantastic reviews. And I, I don't think them slapping an R rating on it is really hurting much in the way of box office for them. And to me, the other interesting thing about that is as a comic, like, adamant comic consumer that bought weekly books for years the reason i think x-men the reason i started reading comics was x-men and it was because of the animated tv show but the reason i when i started to spread out into other realms and read watchmen and all these other comics consistently the comics i would read that were like superhero based were always marvel and it was because of uh the reinvention of daredevil they were doing at the time it was because yeah. of um, the new the X Men storyline Grant Morrison was doing, and they in the comics were getting much darker. Meanwhile, many DC stories felt like the Superman Boy Scout stuff. It's kind of the reason I've always only ever followed Batman. Um, so it's yeah. actually interesting to see that universe writ large in cinema is almost saying the same thing happen with, with, uh, within itself. But anyway, enough waxing a. Uh, philosophical about the marvel well, cinematic <laughs> franchise well, that, at large I mean, that transitions well though into this friggin dark episode it does uh, because it's i mean up. jesus <laughs> it's a fucked up episode holy shit i loved this episode by the way just because oh. i was constantly every corner this episode turned i was like what the shit is happening uh yeah no it like david from the get-go um is a different man like david yeah. in this episode is kind of like the mask, terrible mask portion of Spider-Man Three. Well, I was gonna say it was emo. It was emo Tobey Maguire. Emo, yeah, emo Tobey Maguire. Like that's it's, the exact comparison I did in my head. What's funny is that didn't enter my head when I watched it, but I read this note that said David is much more confident now. Save the girl, kick some ass, get a snack, and I was like, that's that's emo Tobey Maguire. <laughs> uh, I, but and so what's cool about this is immediately he's in this sort of black t-shirt right and he's wearing all black <laughs> yeah and you know you get this idea that okay david something's different about david since 
since he returned. Yeah, because right? he was well, dressing like a gondola, like driver before. right well and he even he even comes back once he returns from his like whatever you know adventure he went on last episode he's in this like vest and stuff it's very it's very this character and then he changes into black and he's just all black <laughs> and then after after taking sid to their sort of the white room where they're able to finally be together where they're all wearing all white then sid starts wearing all black and so he like he almost like you can see she's seduced by him in a way um and yeah, you, she's not trying to hide it. You definitely pick up on those things. And you mention them to me. I'm like, oh, yeah, that did happen. Um, but I, I think those things, they, those kind of stylistic choices they make are meant to be seamless. And I will say, like, I think you have more of an eye for that type of thing. Um, yeah. You know, especially being that you're so heavy, like, film in your life. I kind of yeah. pick up on those things with music as just someone that is, you know, stylistically adept, but also not looking for it. I got that impression without, you know, noticing... Without needing... Yeah, and, that, and that's the thing. I think when... This is a way larger topic, right? Yeah. But people talk all the time about, like, well, you might see something different in it than I do because you're a film student. I'm like, no, no, no. I can just identify and articulate why you felt the way you did. That's it. Like, the feeling should always still be the same. Exactly. the idea that, that David was changing and David was getting darker and Sid was going along with him. I just caught why. That's yeah, it. you're, you're very good difference. at, like peeking behind the curtain right like so I, I i'll hear like man that you'll listen to a song and someone will tell me it sounds so big it's like oh right. yeah that's reverb you can say why yeah right yeah, it's yeah. reverb right yeah. so anyway um you do you uh know what the novel is that um blade runner is based on uh n was it called blade runner <laughs> no i don't i don't <laughs> know what it's called i'm sorry no well maybe my uh pun i wrote down for when they went dark and finally figured out how to be together well, uh, jog your memory. It says, "All right, go for it." Do mutants wet dream of psychic sex? <laughs> this is this is do do robots dream of something, right? Yeah, do androids dream of electric sheep? Do androids dream of electric sheep? That's what it is. Yeah, yeah. that's good. Okay, was that your tweet for the episode, by the way? Oh yeah, we didn't do. Yeah, we did. I think that, that we should was sum it up in a tweet. Sum it oh, up in it? a wait. Did you make a tweet? <laughs> I didn't, so I was gonna try to make one up on my on the spot. Uh, okay, well, so mine is "Do mutants sweat dream of psychic sex," and <laughs> yours is whatever you're about to try right now. Uh, it's white rooms, impending doom. Uh, uh, the rainbow connection. Uh, whiz coming soon. Out of out, out of out of characters. <laughs> It just ended. <laughs> it actually ended coming so. Coming, coming so. Yeah. Damn it! <laughs> <laughs> All right, and Sorry, I wasn't that, it out. That I, that was summing it up in a tweet. Hey, <laughs> we get we got the music and everything. How great is that? We did. Yeah, uh, very good. Okay, we're getting back into it, folks. Um, so speaking of dark, and there's like you know the, um, a lot of sexual stuff going on this episode because there's like the intimacy yeah. with the carries there is the fact that they find a way to be intimate and like it's seamless from real life as far as she's concerned right so mm -hmm. he's finding a way to continually harness his powers what you don't fully understand until you kind of see the aftermath though is because you know the demon with the yellow eyes has taken over because he's gone full-on parasite like you yeah. feel like because and they do a really good job of pulling this off right because if he just started acting different out of nowhere you would almost assume it's this demon we've been seeing. But because sure. he just had this like transformational experience with Oliver, the beat poet, I met your husband, he was a beat poet, which is a great yeah. line. Um, <laughs> you now are thinking maybe he's just emo Toby Maguire because of the confidence that that experience gave him. The experience gave him, yep. You also get um, Melanie, like who reveals that he's been in that state for 20 plus years. Uh, and that he just continued to want to spend more and more time in his mind and essentially got lost there. So you definitely confirm that that was him on that table frozen. And although I think there's still some vagueness on whether Melanie and the group are the good guys, like they clearly are the better people than these other people, but they also might just yeah. be playing David. Um, you see that one reason she definitely wants to keep him on board is to harness his power to bring Oliver back. 
Yeah. Yeah. And, and that's cool. And I like that we got that confirmation that that was her husband. And, and I think she is using him. I still do believe. I think that she's pretty transparent about that, though. She wants to use him. I don't think anyone anticipated how powerful he could be. Yeah. Um, yeah. And this episode shows it for the first time. We've gotten a really good idea that David is powerful mentally. He can, you know literally teleport things with his mind. He can bring you inside a space. He can create physical space out of nothing. Um, but what we hadn't seen is physically how he could use that in combat or, or you know, to, to harm or incapacitate other people. And by God. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like what you get to see in this. And so the large, you know, point here in this episode is that the demon with the yellow eyes has taken over David's body as a parasite, essentially. Um, not that this power is coming from the demon with the yellow eyes, but rather it is in some way using him like a puppet. Yes. Um, because, it, it, because it knows the power he has. So even when you see um, on the security camera that, oh my God, well, what they're looking at when they see heat signals is actually this, this demon. It's not really David. Well, yeah, because uh, there's... Is, well, I was going to say there's Carrie. David's not there, but Carrie, I guess, is just looking at the MRI footage from the past that he's taken right. of David. And you see in there the demon show up in the footage and right. David as a kid. And that's, you know, whatever it is, if he turned on heat vision or whatever, um, all those fancy little electronics going on in there. Carrie, that's kind of his, ooh, light bulb moment to which Revelation, he, yeah. he does, does the exposition, um, you know, later on in the episode. Yeah. And that that really, like, to me, that still, you know, no matter what has infected David, it's using David's real power. So David is an incredibly, incredibly powerful mutant. Um, so that's absurd. And, you, and like what you just mentioned, Carrie giving this exposition for sort of what I had just said, which is, you know, it has taken him over. Like you mentioned, it's been in him for, you know, decades, um, that, that sort of thing. This really sort of put a little bow on all our speculation of who this demon with the yellow eyes you know, wh what it's doing inside of David. We still don't know who it is or how it got there. But, sure. you know, an understanding of the fact that it's utilizing David gives a much clearer understanding to why this is all happening. Because now you've got two Davids. You've got the David who's scared and terrified and doesn't know what's happening, right? Mm -hmm. And the one that is is infected in a way and is allowing that infection to overcome him. Um, so, yeah, it's, it's a, it was a really cool representation of, of that. Yeah, absolutely. The other... Um, the other kind of like dark sexual thing that happens is, uh, and it's, it's kind of a touching moment in its own way, but there's the, there's Sid and David talking. Um, if I recall, I feel like they're talking in his mind, but she talks uh -huh. about the first time she ever swapped her body. Yep. Yep. And it was with her just, mother. Yeah. She swapped her body with her, um, mother and then went and had sex with her mother's boyfriend and then. Like, as he penetrated her, she just had Switched. no idea about these powers, right? So then just switches, and then it was just everyone was screaming. <laughs> everyone was scared. No one knew what happened, and everyone was screaming. Yeah. Uh, yeah that would be how that would go. The, There's also the sexual moment at the end when Lenny begins, Lenny slash demon slash whatever, begins to kiss David as well. Yeah, and grind on him. It's a very sexual episode. It is. Aubrey Plaza kills it in this role. My God. Right? Because she's, like, she's so cool. I always, I mean, I've always liked her from Parks and Rec, but like you also weren't sure if she was a one-trick pony, right? Because she just mm -hmm. played that. And apparently, um, I mean, I, I guess they wrote that character, I think Parks and Rec, around like her real personality mm -hmm. or something like that. Um, and then we've shared like on a prior episode that the uh, Noah Howley met her already had this role written for an old dude, but just thought it was perfect for her. And then she didn't want him to rewrite all the dialogue. So he's reading it as this Benny character, even though she's Lenny and she just run like acting wise goes all over the range because yep. she's psychotic in the first episode in the mental institution, but then she's kind of seductive in others. Um, she's also kind of like the, she's kind of played the good and bad angel on his shoulder. Right? Yeah, and which yes, absolutely. Which has led me to wonder, like, what what her role actually is? Is she just a manifestation of the demon, or is she something that just exists within David's within David's head? Yeah. Um, the other, like, we're probably getting close to an audible break, but I wanted to tackle one pretty significant topic before we move on, which is mm -hmm. um, 
in the virtual, like in his mind, romantic experiences that David and Sid have, do you think he embellishes himself? Oh, because he has the ability to do that, doesn't he? Right? Like he could just look like anyone. So, so that's not as much the question because that would just be speculation. But the question, Mathis, is would you? <laughs> uh, <laughs> well, I, I'm, I'm going to say no comment. What are you going to say? I'm going to say nope. I actually, I'm lying. I That's definitely the right would. answer, right? I definitely would. Oh, okay. <laughs> right? And it doesn't matter. Like, I, I definitely would simply because, like, I also would make myself look like a all, all bunch of celebrities because I could. Uh, yeah, yeah. I'd do, I'd do whatever with my body. Yeah. Right? Okay. All right. Fair enough. Whether, whether yes. it was, like, the normal occurrence or just, like, once I realized you could do that, it's like the sky's the limit. I also probably wouldn't have done it in just a white room, though. If I could make anything happen. Right? We'd be, like, on a cloud. I, w I wonder if, um, since he's just kind of getting into these powers and like, or, or at least being able to control them, I wonder if it episodes go on and their relationship stays, like if it'll be much more in depth, like it'll actually be a house with a backyard and like this <laughs> fake world because he just gets better at like, cause I also imagine as that experience happens, it's, it's harder to focus and maintain that stuff. Yeah, I agree. I agree. I would, I would not even do a house. I'd be like, here, here's a diamond from the sky because it's raining because we're on Jupiter. Yeah, or you could live in an ice cube like Oliver. Or, or <laughs> right? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Absolutely. You could do anything. All right, uh, audible break. <laughs> uh, audible break. We'll be right back. Uh, we'll be right back. Who is it? You have to let me in. There are monsters on the streets. Flesh-eating monsters. What? Are you crazy? Go away. No, please. You can't leave me out here. I will die. They will eat me alive. Oh, shucks. Look, I, I can't let you in. I have a family to protect, but I can make it better. Really? How? How could you possibly make this better? With a coupon, of course. Go to audibletrial.com forward slash buddies and you can get a free book. A book like The Secret by Rhonda Byrne. What the fuck is an audiobook going to do for me? You don't know the secret? The secret has been passed down through the ages. Highly coveted, hidden, lost, stolen, and bought again for vast sums of money. It's been handed down by old tradition and practiced by Plato, Galileo, Beethoven, and even Einstein. It gives you the power to do anything that you want. You've got to be kidding me. No. Not at all. The secret shows you how to realize your optimized reality. It's why I'm in a warm, cozy house with a loving family, eating filet mignon, and you're outside running from flesh-eating beasts. And it's only a four and a half hour listen, and then you'll be good to go. Good luck! But I don't even have headphones! Oh god, they're coming! Ah! Ah! And we are back. Uh, so, I mean, really the only big scene we haven't talked about is like the actual carnage that the happens pursuit, right so like suit yeah yeah he wants to pursue amy well Mel melanie kind of doesn't think he's ready but he's gonna do it anyway um and so he just he just jets without him right and so they go in pursuit of him i will say um this is definitely like a league below the x-men they don't get an x-jet or anything they just have like a limo they just keep driving up in this car and, and getting out of it in the same shot every episode. Like, then Melanie getting out of that car at the mental hospital and here, it's always, like, the same shot. It's, like, panning up to the car from a corner, and they all get out and kind of look over their shoulder. <laughs> so it's kind, of, it's kind of like the uh, the shot in all of those, is it CSI? Where um, yeah. he puts on the yeah, glasses. Yeah, takes off his sunglasses. It's the same. Ah! Exactly. <laughs> yeah. I, do you think it would work better if they had that noise? Just a cat I getting could, stepped on? Yes. I, I, <laughs> I don't think it was the sound of a cat getting stepped on. No? No. Yeah. It would, it would, I could absolutely uh, see a, a super cut of every time they stepped out of that limo and then you play that song. Yeah. Um, I could also yeah. see a so super cut of... Russo or whatever his name is, putting on those glasses, and then instead of playing what actually plays them, just playing different like cat agony sounds. <laughs> putting, yeah, <laughs> 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 just the next episode, and the guitar. 
<laughs> yeah, then the guitar comes in right after. Hey, someone uh, make that. Yeah, someone, fans. Someone throw that together. Make those super cuts. <laughs> and then and then just we'll give you the boob tube buddy watermark to put on it. And we'll re we'll, we'll retweet it. Yeah. About that. There we go. Yeah. Um, <laughs> you you were telling me, and I wanted you to save it for the air, but you were telling me you had a compelling question as well. Oh, it's not compelling. It's it's probably pretty um it's probably it probably highlights me as a person who doesn't pay attention to things. Um, <laughs> Except for wardrobe yeah. changes and, like, I, and thematic point. stylings. <laughs> Just not apparently new character introductions, because I don't know who their fifth was on the pursuit. Who is this dude? It's the, it's the or, eye. or rather their fourth. Okay, so that's that's what the reveal is, is that the whole time that was the eye. Yes, now he has been, like, I think he showed up in other episodes, just never with okay. talking parts. Like, he just is there in the background. And so he cool. is part of their entourage, but you see him flash in and out as the eye. Right. And... And then you see the eye in pursuit, mm -hmm. which confuses me. But ultimately, the eye obviously has weird powers and can pick up on David being there. So I, I right. think it's like, uh, you know, a, a mole. That was my character. My character. That was my question. Was like I obviously saw the eye switch into him at the end, and I didn't know if that was the one of the eyes. You know, abilities is to turn into someone that he can see or you know inhabit their body in some way. Or if this the whole time has been the eye in disguise and that that's also one of his abilities, you know, is to shapeshift. Um, so anyways, that, that, that was my thing. Cause I was just like, the I, I was confused at the end versus wait, is that a dude that I just don't recognize or know that well? Or yeah. Has it really been I mean, I'm sure if we perused Reddit, we'd see some people that have like analyzed it or shown other shots in the prior episodes. Yeah. But ultimately I don't think, you're supposed to 100% know, but I think the implication is it is the eye, unless the eye just has yeah. some weird powers we're, we're not quite sure about. Yeah, I, I think I feel like the questions I ask every episode are the answers always like, I guess we'll find out. You know, <laughs> like, I, I, well, I always I mean, feel like I'm, I'm misperceiving it. But Yeah, yeah, I think it's just the nature of the show. I mean, half of the stuff we talked about when we were doing Westworld, I feel is very similar because you get into a situation where, I mean, part of the show is that you don't know what's real. Yeah. So you just kind of keep going through it and guessing and guessing anyway, you know? Yeah. So, um, it's, but anyways, they pursue David and they, they arrive at, uh, that, the place D3, right? Division yeah. Three. And there are just bodies and blood everywhere. And all of them so are, good. are partially inside of stuff it's and I, ground <laughs> and, and it's all practical effects from what I could tell. So I'm sure that was just the most fun. Like all these effects companies making different limbs and just gluing them to the floor and you actually get to walk through that carnage. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's a mess because when David said that like he and Sid were going to go and they'll kick some ass or whatever, yeah. I was kind of like, what does that actually look like? What, like, what does David kicking ass take the form of? And when you watch the X-Men go kick ass, it's it's kind of fun, right? Yeah. Punch someone, or even you know, I compare it to the escape sequence from episode one of this show, right? Yeah, they're yeah, yeah. Away, sure. And they're kind of throwing people away, and they're flying through the air, or they're punching them, and it's kind of fun to watch. Watching David do this to well, people is not. <laughs> not well, fun. so it's almost like the aftermath isn't fun because you just see the carnage, but seeing him do it is still perfectly enjoyable. He's basically doing like ballet. It's enjoyable in a very dark way. Yeah. It's like well, there's watching, that. It, it, it's like watching a villain like kick ass. Yeah, but he's like he's spinning. Not, he's not and, just beating them up. He's pirouetting and spinning. No, but like it's so good. There's one thing where he does like a almost like a Spider Man flip, and they just turn into black smoke and like then yep. fly back. Like uh, very enjoyable. Now, what isn't enjoyable is when they see the heat vision camera and it's like just the weird Eggman walking through and just his fingers are just twitching almost as if they're breaking or they're like arthritic. And that's when it's a little more, uh, off putting in my opinion. Uh, I, I would agree with that. I would agree with that. This whole, this, this sequence makes David out to seem like a villain for me. And it, it is meant to be that way because for all intents and purposes, that's what he kind of is right now. And the hope is that we're able to remove this villain from him and, you know, harness his power for some form of good, but there's never going to be a time when David is not dangerous as fuck, you know, and, and just an absolute, like, you know, terror. Um, yeah. So I, but you're right. The, the sequences of him doing ballet and, and, and things are, are incredible. One thing I was um, talking to Michael about when we covered Logan, which I think is just an interesting question 
when it comes to any of, of X-Men, but it's particularly important in the X-Men films is, um, you're right, regardless if he's good or bad, he is incredibly dangerous. Uh, you know, not quite like a nuke, but, you know, something like that, right? Uh, yeah. And they've, they asked this question in Superman vs. Batman, which was terrible. Civil War talks about it. Like, in Civil War, in the comics, it was about X-Men. And what happened is there was a reality show um, with a superhero group, and they're kind of, like, showing their adventures. But on live television, a school gets blown up by a villain. Like, uh, hundreds of kids die. And then it becomes the government wants every mutant to register basically as a weapon, and that right. way they can find them, like no more secret identities. And that's the theme in like the early X Men movies and earlier comics where Senator yeah. Gary or whatever is trying to lock them up or at least have a registry so they can keep them from doing damage. And ethically, you're obviously like, you know, it's like asking a Muslim sure. to uh, register, which I think is kind of right. the current. It's the analogy. Yeah. Analogy, right? But it's, you know, in. To me, I would say even someone like David, until he did something like this, like there would be no ethical reason to say you have to like you know be on watch. Right, and and yeah, that that's a very good point. Until until he turns into a you know an act, actual present danger, which uh, the government agent agent is uh, definitely willing to admit. Like that was a pretty creepy scene when he's alive, the old dude in the gray suit, but his foot's mm -hmm. like in the ground, and he yep. just. Uh, what, he's like, we were wrong. We, were we wrong. thought we were ready. So much power. power. It wears a <laughs> human face. Which, you want to that say it wears a human face again. Fin fin finish your impression. It wears a human face. It <laughs> wears a human face. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, that was him. That was, that was right. So, one... I don't know this this is a government agent trying to like keep these people uh and it obviously didn't play out that well but i guess my other question is how did like did he see the true form as he was being dead and then just says like oh that's not the david we know the whole time we that's who it is um i imagine because what they saw him doing i mean it he's either implying that they did not know that he could disintegrate people with his mind that's one thing, right? Like, they knew that he could do, kind of like what I was saying earlier, they knew he could do weird brain things, right? But they didn't know that he could Clinical literally. Term. It's a weird brain things. Weird, yeah. weirder, weirdy brain things. W yeah, but they WBT didn't know that he could do weirder brain. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But then there's weirder brain things, which makes it confusing because that's still W, uh, yeah, BT. Uh, <laughs> but th that's, that's, <laughs> that's what David did when he disintegrated people. Those are weirder brain things. Yeah, W uh, or BT. WR, yeah. Mm -hmm. But either he's implying that they didn't know that, or yeah, they saw the physical form and they were like, "Oh shit, that's not David. That's a that's a slug fat guy," you know? Yeah, yeah. And uh, um, but either way, he said so much power, and I think that that means they they saw what he's capable of, you which know, they so already much. thought he was capable of a lot. But now they're just obviously terrified. Um, I will also say we've talked about this in the past, where like he had like the gondola outfit. I think we even talked about it in the show already. Yeah. Uh, it also reminds me of a mime. His dancing yeah. reminded me of mime as well. Of a mime? Yeah. He's kind of that way? Yeah. Well, and now that I think, Wiry and, yeah. Now that I think about what the question you kind of just asked, D3 was, Division 3 was set up with men with guns, right? Like, they prevent, they protected themselves with men with guns. Yeah. Because they, they thought that that could prevent him. So they had a clear us, underestimation of what he was capable of. Just based on the protection that they, they armed themselves with, you know? Yeah, that's true. Like, with, it's not like they had. Yeah, you, you didn't have this like kind of typical comic thing that you would, or comic book thing you would read in a comic, which is when the villain attacks, um, or even the heroes attack. There's multiple super villains, or like you know, kind of a few bosses, so to speak, that are there. Right. Like they clearly yeah. just had the eye and a bunch of people with guns. So that's actually a, a, a good call out there. Um, the other thing in there that I wanted to talk about was. Well, we talked about Carrie, right, and his, like, analysis uh -huh. that he's, he is kind of schizophrenic, but simply because someone else has taken over half of his mind. Yeah, he literally he, has multiple personalities. Yeah, so he really has multiple right. personalities. Um, that's kind of what I wanted to, to hone in on is how, how much do you buy Carrie's analysis and then, like, what are the implications? Is it simply that every character he sees, whether it be Lenny Benny, whether it be, like, 
little Hitler, whether it be the demon with yellow eyes, are they all just the demon with yellow eyes? Or does he have these other just kind of things that haunt him and the demon with the yellow eyes is exploiting them periodically and like in the event of Aubrey yeah. Plaza fully taking, like, you know, what, what are you yeah. feeling? Well, it's, it's a hard question to answer because the implication is that this thing has been inside of him his entire life, right? Like yeah, 30 th years. 30 years. Yeah. Right? Yeah. So what David is like without the demon isn't even really known. You know, would he have harbored these other personalities in his brain, the, the, the Hitler and the, you know, and Aubrey Plaza's character? Would he have done that if there had not been the demon there infecting him the whole time? So I don't think we'll really know the answer to that question until the demon is sort of, until David is rid of the demon. The question is going to become, who is David without the parasite, you know? And the second that that thing leaves his body and we get to see real David and he sort of comes back down to earth, then we're really going to see what's left, what's still inside his brain, what, what are the remnants of that, or rather what was always there to begin with, you know, but we thought was the demon. It's actually David, you know? Yeah, and, that, and I mean, the 30-year the time frame we obviously simply get from Carrie, uh, we don't know if that's actually true. Well, he was a big head in the sky, uh, so I mean, what he said had to be true, right? That's true. That's some pretty sweet, like, you know, retro sci-fi tech. It absolutely was. I mean, he needed a way for everybody to to see him all at one time. He couldn't be on a phone, so he had to project himself somehow into yeah, the sky. FaceTime was a lot cooler forty years ago, <laughs> right? So, yeah, really. Uh, yeah, good point. This is this is in the past, right? Yeah, the, uh, <laughs> I love that type of stuff. They're like the kind of alternate history type thing. Yeah. Um, Warren yeah. Warren Ellis, who's one of my favorite comic writers, I remember had a bit or like a, a line of dialogue one time about. You know, all the sci-fi from the 60s and 70s constantly had us talking on, like, video chat. Yeah. Right? Yet, none of them would have predicted that the primary form of communication is, like, you know, roughly 140 character messages to one another. <laughs> like, text message, text messaging and messaging in general far overshadows uh, video chat. But that yeah. wouldn't feel futuristic, so no one would have ever tried to even think about predicting it because it's not fun. Yeah, that's true. Any thought I have about the future is some cool technology I would want to use, whereas if you had told me, uh, obviously I wasn't alive much before texting, but if you had, if I was alive in the 70s and you told me that one day I'd be able to type to people, I'd have been like, fuck you, man. Like, I want, I want to believe something better than that. Well, especially after like the phone. Right? Yeah. Like, because I take that a lot longer better. to type things, but I also have realized that half the stuff I want to call someone for is to say, on my way home, do you need anything? In which case it would be, no thanks, honey. And then we're fine. Instead of like, ring, right. ring. Because to me, there's this, uh, and this is probably just my being neurotic, but I always feel this pressure if I call someone or answer the phone that it's got to be about more than that one thing. Right, because now you've initiated a conversation. Yeah, it's now, okay, perfect. Um, so, you know, then how was your day? And like, you know what I mean? You just go through everything. Same, yep. So, yep. Um, anyway, but I guess the last thing to talk about is, af well, one other question I had is, mm -hmm. um, I feel like the doctor seems so guilty and schmarmy. The doctor in the Yeah, they in go the in there. Prison cell? Yeah, Amy's gone, and he is just not acting like a good guy. This dude has, I mean, he's been kind of beaten and broken and presumably tortured, but I mean, he never really seemed like a good guy, right? Like even when he was leading like the therapy circles, he kind of seemed like the dick who was just there to do his job, you know, and he, yeah. and now he's being punished for basically being an apathetic, you know, employee in the first place. Um, so uh, he was never really a likable character, but yeah, he got, he got kind of maniacal there at the end. And then he just calls Sid a bitch when she walks out. But, but I guess my... Why Why was he ever in prison? So, did they settle on that? Like, was it settled that he definitely was just a doctor and was in prison simply because he knew who David was? Or was he a plant that this... Is it D3? A plant that D3 put yeah. in there to essentially help learn, like, learn about David, not really has the qualifications, and now that David's gone and they're, you know, breaking all kinds of laws, they just put him in jail because otherwise, like, you know... Well, who was it that said, um, it was either him or, or Amy that said they just kept taking us to a room and asking us questions, the same questions. I don't know. 
you remember that? I thought it was him. I think in that conversation with Sid, oh, okay. he mentions that they keep taking them out of his, that room and keep asking him questions about David, but it's always the same questions over and over. So I think they are still treating him like some source of information about David. Gotcha. Uh, okay. But yeah, I mean, why why he's a you know raging sphincter in this scene? I don't know. <laughs> raging, huh? So anyway, now now we're uh, now it's banjo time. We talk talk about the rainbow connection or or are you going to play some banjo music (laughs) no it's just david has this sweet all white outfit with like a cool like futuristic not even futuristic probably asian inspired collar and he's playing this like white banjo with a white maple neck and i was all about it it was super cool except that he's like crying and terrified it looks like someone has a gun to his head (laughs) the whole time he's playing this song yeah uh yeah say bluegrass or die you can also uh, so so that song on banjo I used to know how to play on on a, my dad's old banjo and you can tell that uh, David Holler here that's no David Holler is the character name uh, Dan Stevens um, did learn how to play that song on banjo oh yeah, yeah 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 you, you can it, watch his hands and with me not it. knowing the song I just usually look for that type of stuff and you could definitely tell he was. Even if he's he wasn't not that good at it is one way that you can tell that he yeah. learned it because he's not fantastic at it. And the meter of the song is different than the way that he plays it in this scene. Yeah. So I think this is just the easiest way for a non banjo player to quickly pick up and learn a classic banjo song. I was going to uh, say he definitely I, I, knew I the scene. like the song intimately, even if he couldn't play it, like he was hitting the notes in the right time to oh, yeah. match the audio. But that, that oh, makes yeah. sense. But yeah, he looks off to, he looks broken like a gun to his head. He looks off, uh, yeah, like out to the distance, which there's this red room. Sid starts walking towards it, and then there's like uh, the puppy, like King, and the little Hitler mm-hmm. in there. And then yep. it's just like weird. She's looking in a telescope and realizes like that's David's now home, and so now we're gonna go to his home. And you're like, okay, this is, uh, you know, probably not the best. Yeah, it's terrifying, but it's also kind of like David trying to drop a little hints for mm-hmm. her, you know? Like, that's the real true. David is in the white room, right? That That's sort of what we've gotten from a lot of this episode. The real David is in that white room, um, and it's sort of, he's trapped in there in a way, you know? Um, and it, it's not that that room is impenetrable, as we learn in the end, right? Mm-hmm. But but when Sid escapes to that room with David, we can be reasonably certain that she's she's interacting with the real thought process of, of David. Yes, yes. Um and this is kind of like, you know, there's Lenny and Benny and King and Hitler. And, um, you know, that's when she comes out of the mirror. It's kind of like he just starts convulsing. His eyes go white. It's a fairly creepy scene. When the which, which part? I apologize. So like when after she comes out of the mirror, you know, there's the David in black off to the side. Oh, yeah. And his eyes just start convulsing, and you kind of see that dichotomy, but you also have all these characters just all showing up. So it's all these same ones we've seen throughout there, and that's when we kind of get the reveal uh, that, because he's, you know, talking to his sister, right? We get the reveal mm-hmm. that he's adopted. Yes, yeah, which, again, like you, like you said earlier, we already talked about that, but hu- huge moment for, for David. But he's also, like, very maniacal when he's asking about that secret. Yeah. Like, I know you have a secret. You need to tell me something. And the second he hears it, he, like, kind of, like, just gets confused. <laughs> mm-hmm. And he doesn't stay sort of evil. But, yeah, this sort of creepy horror story scene of everything popping out of the walls, you know, freaking his sister out. Yeah. Um, well, and I would imagine, like, the moment, the thing that goes through you immediately, your mind, when you realize you have powers and the parents you grew up with aren't your parents is does, do what my, were my parents like, yeah. What were my parents like, did they have, I mean, I guess that's just the natural thing for anyone that finds out they're adopted, but also to this be like, are they to blame for me having these like terribly debilitating, debilitating like mental issues and or powers? Yeah. Right. Uh, yeah. it also, and I wonder the, the door to professor X as we've talked about, right. which is how it is. Which I was going to say, I wonder how much more of this season will be focused on that, or if that's a, a mystery that will be saved until next season, because this is five. We've got three episodes to go to wrap up whatever story they want to tell about. David oh, it's only eight. First. He's eight. My goodness. Um, I believe so. Well, yeah, I'm curious how it'll go then. But I mean, we basically get the, um, the rest of Melanie and the group going to the house. They do a, a cool stylistic thing where there's no audio, uh, whatsoever. Carrie kind of splits um, up, right? And then the eye shows yep. up. Yep. Like, you can kind of tell, like, okay, this is when you're 
your question earlier, oh, okay, he is part of that guy because then he comes up and he, you know, shots are fired. Uh, you know what I mean? Like it just gets he's either real- part of him or he's he has taken over him. So, something there with yeah. the eye at the end who, that he has manipulated his physical form. Uh, he's definitely done that. Whether he took the form of some other guy, but then the question is, I don't know who that guy otherwise would have been. I like the idea that that was a the eye and sort of like as a mole. Yeah, I don't know what that other guy's you know mutant gifts are or whatever. I do too. Um, but but yeah, so that that probably is the case. But yeah, then Sid grabs him and says, "Take take me to the white room." And right, then the white demon room, shows up and is like kind of slowly yeah. walking around. This is one of those things. So so monster movies, right? The idea of a monster movie, and this came from Jaws, right? Which is that it's it's scarier. I don't know how they phrase it, you know, classically, but um, the monster you can't see is scarier than the monster you can, essentially. So you don't see the the shark a lot in Jaws, and that actually makes it more terrifying. And then you see a little bit of it, and it's it freaks you out, but then it goes away, right? And they They're, they invented that technique because the Jaws the shark looked awful. Yeah, what's funny is uh, there's a I was at Universal not too long ago and did the like horror movie <clears throat> makeup show, which is great, and they have a little museum out front. And I was reading, and there's a quote from Steven Spielberg, which I will also kind of paraphrase, which is what you just said. Um, mm-hmm. but he basically said modern audiences wouldn't like Jaws, like the old rules that we had, which were like, it's scarier what's off screen is on screen. Um, they now hold against me, but it's also my fault because of Jurassic Park. Because you showed all the dinosaurs. Yeah. You, in great yeah, detail. Really, he, and like, he invented the idea that like, no, here's the thing and that it's amazing looking and we're going to, we're going to hold on it. You know, yeah. get to see it. Yeah. It went from like, let's just use this very, um, rudimentary like animatronic shark and like key moments and still just make a a great landmark film and now that we have all the technology let's let you see a t-rex like running after a car you know let's let you see velociraptors attack it i'm trying to determine whether watching this demon walk around this room so so in the light it was a good thing or bad thing for this because he looks scary and equally ridiculous he does he's scary equally ridiculous his outfits and tatters (laughs) <laughs> if it goes on for much longer, you're going to start laughing, but you're still uneasy. And yes, then exactly. they're all just back in therapy and Aubrey Plaza is the therapist. Which literally came out of nowhere. I had finished, I had seen most of this episode and then I was like, oh, I need to watch the end of this Yeah, you only had like 10 minutes left and it's just crazy. Uh, yeah, and then I was like, I was like, I think I know generally what happens here. I'm, I'm sure I can get where it goes at the end. And I watched it and I was like, wait, what the, what the fuck? Yeah. Where, what, what happened? Uh, but I'm so used to this show cutting to credits at this point in, in moments where I'm like, oh, I can feel it coming. And in a good way, because I'm like, this yeah. is where they're going to fucking cut me off, isn't it? And yeah. there it is. There's the, there's the, you know, the cheesy... Yeah, yeah, credit sequence. Um, it's one of those things that, like, I remember after the first episode, I was like, are they going to be done with the mental hospital? Like, I thought it was going to be a superhero one flew over the cuckoo's nest. Right. Uh, I definitely wasn't expecting it to be, like, a secret reveal five episodes in. <laughs> right? <laughs> well, yeah, that's true. And so, I mean, it, it what they mean by this, there's two things they could mean by this, right? A lot of this has been in people's heads and that they've really been in the mental hospital the whole time, which is the unlikely one because they've invested a lot of time in world building. Uh-huh. But it would be it would be the ballsy one. <laughs> it would be the ballsy <laughs> you know? one. It would be the ballsy way to go. The other way to go is that, you know, this is some sort of other projected, you know, mental space that David is creating or some some other such illusion. So we'll see. Yeah. I mean, they could also split the difference where... um I don't know, someone like Melanie or whatever has just continually been, been visiting him while he's in there. And, um, mm. you know, he's gone into her mind and he knows all these things about these multiple, you know what I mean? They could do some kind of weird oh, hybrid true. where they split the difference and the world building is absolutely true. But the reason he right. knows about the world building is because he's continually coming into contact with someone whose mind he yeah. reads. And meanwhile, he hasn't been part of it. Um, so but he's never a, actually left the hospital. Yeah, so there's a way to be ballsy about it, uh, still have the world building, still have all the mental craziness going on, and then also maybe tie it up, resolve it, and get some forward momentum. But we shall see. Yeah, um, we will. But uh, I don't know, if, unless you have anything else to talk about, you ready to put a bow on this bitch? Let's put a bow on this bitch. See you next time, little buddies. There it is. Uh, you couldn't see the wink, though. I winked. Oh, nice. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right.
Very good. I'm going to stop recording.